everyone who is here for the seminar session. You can see your patience and diligence. We have a very nice lineup of speakers for you today. The second round of seminars here at Rastafari Roots Fest 2018. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Anthony Pattinger, who presently heals from Trinidad and Tobago, and he's part of the All Mansions Rastafari organization there, who have been advocating and agitating for the full legalization of the herb. So, Dr. Pattinger has an interesting presentation here entitled The Endocannabinoid System and Medicinal Properties of Cannabis. But he's going to talk and give you a context for that. So without further ado, let's welcome with a round of applause Dr. Anthony Pottinger. Dr. Anthony Pottinger, good times. Thank you very much for the introduction. I must say, um, I was hoping to see at least 200 people in front of me. Yeah, and up to this morning when I met Dr. Hall, I wasn't sure at what level to pitch this thing. And he told me it's like a high level and I should expect about 200 people. <laughs> so right now, I, 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 was, I was originally thinking that I'd be just talking to me in the lay people. So we did more rapping at a lower level. But, you know, when Dr. Hall told me that the presentations yesterday were fairly high, I just had to go and pull a talk I did about a month ago. So I hope I won't be talking over most people here, and I, and I hope I won't be boring the people who know the material. So... Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, help, help with this thing, and let's turn on this thing. I don't want to extend for it too much because I, you know, we have a half hour. So be patient with me. I probably just want to read and see if you could follow on the screen. I hope you can see on the screen. Um, and at any, well, at the end, we get question and answer. All right, cool. And will you collide there in there? I probably can't even see this thing. Uh, all right. I'm Jamaican actually, but I exiled in Trinidad because I'm a wife. <laughs> I went to Trinidad in 79 and, and um, my first degree is in agriculture. And she was a classmate. And um, a quick thing, after a couple of years I switched to medicine. And then I specialized in obstetrics and gynecology. And then I subspecialized in gynecological oncology. So uh, my practice is, is, is in gynecological cancers. But um, this is like this is like an hobby. Alright? So, I right, try to make it some bit bigger. All right, cool. But well, give me some uh, going on. Uh -uh. Yeah, bridge. Yeah. Uh -huh. Let's start. So I am a little bit of a technological dinosaur, you know. So, wanna help me? Yes. That, just wanna go to the next one. Yeah. If you just put Windows control it from right or so. Yeah, alright, cool. Alright. Second slide. Alright, cool. Yes, see hope you can read this. Yeah, cannabis has been a medis medicinal plant of unparalleled versatility for millennia. And Everything I write here, so I put a reference because I was talking to academics when I made this, and they like reference. Cannabis is one of the most investigated therapeutic substances, and this thing I get all of a problem. More than 20,000 studies and reviews have been published in scientific literature. The vast majority prove that its active ingredients are uniquely safe and effective. Side effects are relatively mild and short acting and there is no lethal dose. You know, as opposed to um, like the opioids and, and cocaine and those things, they can stimulate certain receptors in your hindbrain, 
are, are block the receptor. So they could stop your heart, or they could stop your breathing, or might speed up your heart so fast that it can't relax enough for blood to come in. So when it contract, it's not pushing out anything. So them things, if you take a high dose, it could kill you. Acute toxicity. That don't happen with cannabis because it don't stimulate any of these receptors in the brain stem that control the heart and the respiratory system. So I don't like to tell people that cannabis is not toxic. So I like to say it's, it's not, there's no acute toxicity because if you're using the thing heavy over a long period of time, especially if you're smoking, there are problems that can happen. Just like with, if you smoke anything else, it can, it can do damage to your lungs. It's mechanism of action. No. Sorry. Its mechanism of action was unsolved. It's an unsolved mystery until the discovery of THC. Big formula, just call it Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. And that was by an Israeli scientist in 1964. Then the first cannabinoid receptor, which is called CB1, was discovered in 88. And the endocannabinoids, these are chemicals that the body produced that could stimulate the receptors. Right? The first one was anandamide, and that is the chemical name there. Arachidonyl ethanol amide, R A E A, was discovered in 1992. And then A2 AG was discovered in 95. All right. Yeah. A host of phytocannabinoids, this is the term for THC, CBD, all of them, right? So, yeah, yeah. A host of phytocannabinoids were discovered in the 1960s. Thus far, researchers have identified over 100 phytocannabinoids, but some are actually artifacts of analysis and are produced in trace quantities that have not permitted thorough investigation. These are by, as a reference from those people. So we're going to look at the, uh, the top five. They are the most important one, top six. So you have CBD that was actually discovered before THC by the same group of people in Israel in 1963. Then CBG in 64, CBC in 66, CBCV 69, and THCV in 1970. All right. The overwhelming preponderance of research focus on THC, however, because of the psychoactive effect. Only recently has renewed interest been manifest in the THC analogs, that is all the others. Each cannabinoid produces a distinct action in the human body, while different combination and ratios produce yet another range of distinct action. So if you have a hundred um, a hundred chemicals, each of which could have some kind of medicinal or some kind of physiological activity. And then if you change the ratios and combination of each, the, the, the potential is infinite, the amount of medicines that could come out of this thing. And um, I'm just hoping that over the next 10, 20 years, the things can really free up so scientists can really research it properly to get what we call you know, level one evidence, you know, double-blind control randomized trials so that people who have to say we need more research, we need more research, and the information we have is anecdotal. Meaning you cannot extrapolate it to basically most people. And that is what is lacking in cannabis research right now. Because the thing is, is illegal, most people can't get the thing or get ethical approval to do proper studies over a long period of time, especially to get approval for, for human studies. So a lot of the information that we have medicinally about cannabis is on small studies or things in petri dish, cell culture, or animal studies, but not much in human studies, and it's because of the prohibition that's holding it back. So let's hope that the thing can really free up so that we can really start to study this thing because it seems like, I think 50 years in the future, those people are going to look back at us and say, boy, the people was real stupid. You know what I mean? They're holding back this thing so much. Yes. So the scientists refer to when you use everything as the entourage effect. And this is important because it, it, 
most most scientists and doctors think so, all right, we could isolate the active substance and test it. All right, so we make isolate CBD and use it as most people looking at medicinal marijuana as being basically CBD. And let's use this for seizures and pain and inflammation and too. But we may be we may be short changing ourselves because if you use the plant with everything, um, the, the, the overall effect might be better than, than any of the components by themselves individually. And as I'm going to point out later, THC and CBD is like a nice tag team. And, and the both of them together is better than either of them by themselves, if not high doses individually. So other key components of the activity of cannabis and its extract are the terpenoids. Most people don't know about the terpenoids. Can't get into it right now because the time's short, but we'll just mention a little bit later. All right, and they have been under research. All right. So the phytocannabinoids and the terpenoids are, are synthesized in secretory cells inside glandular, what are called trichomes, all right, that are most highly concentrated in the unfertilized female flowers prior to the plant getting old. Now, uh, the, most people in the year hemp or year marijuana is a kind of confusion. It's the same thing, but like the, the hemp plant basically produce a low level of THC and medical legally it have to have less than 0.3% THC to be called hemp and a lot of times it's a male plant right the female plant now you have to prevent it from get fertilized if you get fertilized it start produce seed and want to reproduce and thing so it don't produce it don't grow as big and it don't produce as much as the THC CBD etc so uh, planters who understand what they're doing and know the difference from earlier clock, they pluck out the plant, they pluck out the male plant so it can't fertilize the female plant. So the female plant grow bigger and stronger and bigger flowers and produce higher, higher concentration of the, the active ingredient. So when people say sensi male, it just means seedless. So it just means that you want a plant that is not fertilized by the male plant and naturally both in place in Jamaica, that would have given you about maximum 8 to 10 percent of THC. So now that mainly America, California, and thing um, have all kind of hybrids, they're breeding and breeding up the THC to all 30 and 35 percent, and thing and breeding down the CBD. So this is a new thing. I mean, this never exists on the earth before. So people don't know what effect this will have if people start to use it plenty. And some people just want stronger and stronger thing and high grade and more and more THC. But THC without CBD and the rest of things, we don't know what it's going to do to you if you're using this all the time. So we in Jamaica and the worst of the Caribbean, we have to stick to our things that we have, our seeds and our articultural properties to maintain the natural plant that we have. So we can compete with America in terms of volume and size, right? So we have to keep a natural thing, let them go and produce their thing. And if people want to get a real original thing, that's probably what we know most about for hundreds of years and how to not body and all this kind of nonsense about make work, make you get mad and all them kind of things. And we have to just market this as a niche thing. This is the original organic thing and not the new kind of things. <laughs> Everybody agree with me? Yes. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so come down. Yeah, there's a synergism between the cannabinoids and the terpenoids. And this may play a role in the widely held, but not experimentally based view that in some cases, plants are better drugs than the natural products isolated from them. So rather than use THC by itself, CBD by CBC by itself, they have the whole thing. All right, let's just look at the, some of the phytocannabinoids, right? Everybody knows plenty of things about THC, so let me just rush through it quick. THC is the most common phytocannabinoid in the original plants, because you have plants now, I tell you, coming out of California where they're breeding out like they shot that swim. They're breeding out the THC and breed out CBD. They have some plants in CBG. They breed it up and breed out other things. So 
what we're talking about here, we're talking about the original native something, all right? All right. It is a partial agonist. An agonist means a chemical that will latch on to a receptor. And the, chem all right. the chemical is like the key, and the receptor is the lock to open the door so that certain things can happen inside the cell. Everybody with me? So an agonist will come and open it. An antagonist will put into the lock. A key where it can't fit really, so it can go into the lock and can't open the lock. So it blocks the thing and you can't open the door even if you have the right key after. So it's called an antagonist. Everybody clear? So it's nice to be an agonist or antagonist or woman. Alright. It is a partial agonist at CB1 and CB2 receptor. And it is analogous, means similar to anandamide. Anandamide is a natural cannabinoid that our body produce to stimulate these receptors. Now it is believed that some of the illnesses where we have some of them weird kind of pain syndrome and all them kind of things, phantom leg and, and um, post-traumatic stress disorder and them things. Maybe something called a, a cannabinoid deficiency syndrome. So just like how some people can't produce enough insulin so they're diabetic and they can't produce enough thyroid hormone or a woman not have enough estrogen and you can replace it so that is hormone replacement. So same thing, things might go wrong that we can't produce enough anandamide or the other things and it cause certain problems physiologically and THC and CBD you now can be substitute to replace the anandamide we can't produce and correct the disorders. Everybody with me? All right, so let me just touch that again. It is a partial agonist at CB1, and these are receptors mainly in your central nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord. And the CB2 receptors is in the periphery, like your liver and heart and kidney and spleen and all that in your gut. All right, and it is analogous to anandamide. All right, and this underlies many of its activities that are psychoactive agent and analgesic, muscle relaxant, and antispasmodic. Additionally, it is a bronchodilator, so it, so it can help with asthma. The asthma you have the bronchioles, the muscles, them in spasm and it can relax it so you can breathe. You can get into your alveolar and exchange oxygen. Uh, it's a neuroprotective antioxidant, especially, all right. That just means if you have trauma to your brain, you know, or stroke and all them kind of things. If you have these things here, it helps to minimize the damage. You know, because it's strongly anti-inflammatory. You hardly see anybody who use plenty of herbs getting Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and all them degenerative brain thing. All right? So I personally use the oil because I have a strong family history. My father and a couple of his brothers and them, all of them get Alzheimer's when they reach around 60. And I don't want to get it. Right? And it's 10 of us and none of them are bigger than me. Six of them older than me, none of them are getting it. So. I might have the short straw, so <laughs> plus I don't sleep good through medical school and internship and being and call, you know, you have to wake up as the people go off, you have to get up, this and that, and it affects your sleep, all right, and sleep is very important, there's another talk by yourself because if you don't get enough sleep, you have, all right, wakefulness called brain damage, when we are awake, we produce a chemical, um, is a byproduct of being wake, called beta amyloid and this thing can accumulate in your brain and when we sleep you have four levels of sleep you know level one two three and four you have to try to get into level three and four sleep during that time is like the brain of a storage system that will clear out the beta amyloid and if you don't get enough sleep or good enough quality sleep the beta amyloid accumulate and it come up the system and block up transmission and information from different parts of the brain uh, Dr. Hall may you know, highlight that little later on. And this is one of the main things we believe behind Alzheimer's and plenty of them other senile dementia. Alright, so this is one of the things where cannabis is very good in helping to clear up the beta amyloid accumulation in your brain. Alright, additionally, yeah, uh, going back, let me just run through this quick a bit, but we'll go over time. Additionally, it is a bronchodilator and it's a neuroprotectant antioxidant, we just said to you. It is antipyretic and it prevents itching and things, particularly in cholestatic jaundice. That is, let me not go in. All right. 
it has 20 times the anti-inflammatory power of aspirin. 20 times, right? And twice that of hydrocortisone. And these aspirin and hydrocortisone are two of the most regularly used things, you know, for, for you know, anti-inflammatory drugs. THC is likely to avoid potential pitfalls of either COX-1 or COX-2. That is an enzyme, especially like in your stomach, that if you block it, it could cause it could cause it to get like like peptic ulcers and things like that. Now I get into you know more of that. Alright, this was a talk to doctors, so I could just leave it like that. THC is likely to avoid potential pitfalls of either COX-1 or COX-2 inhibition. Um, as such activity is only noted at concentrations far above those attained therapeutically. So you're not going to use anything you're using the cannabis for the sleep or, or to relax your muscle or prevent pain. You're not going to get the level high enough to block these two enzymes to cause no problems. Alright, THC is also cytotoxic. That word means it kills cancer cells. It's several tumors, especially brain cancers in mice and rats. All right, when THC was injected into the tumors, the cancer died with no damage to normal brain tissue. And these studies were being done 40 years now. University of Virginia was looking at this. And, and when they started to report that this thing killing the cancer cells, you know, the mice and rat brain and thing, the American organization, they were controlled them funding and they shut it down because they don't want no research to show no benefits or properties. All the research must just show adverse effects. So the, 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 this gets stalled. About 20 years after the people them in Portugal and Spain pick it up and was doing similar thing, and they, they couldn't even get the information from 20 years before to help them along. So they must have reinvent the wheel all over again. So 40 years now after we know this, the thing should have developed to the point now where we could be we we'll be using this instead of using chemo or radiation and thing. We can't discriminate between the cancer. This. Yo. yo, yo, all right. But the much. What are going on there, someone? The chemotherapy cannot discriminate between the cancer cells and the chemo cells. Normal oncologists, I use whatever chemo, and not demonizing chemo. Chemo has plenty good role, and I have seen people where the chemo helps, along with surgery and radiation, to cure them. But it comes at a big cost. So if, the, if, if eventually we can get medicines out of cannabis that can discriminate between the cancer cells and normal cells, that will be a major contribution forward. And, and, and Babylon shut this down over 40 years now. It's just no time it will have to free up again, so we will set back plenty. All right. When THC was injected into the tumors in the brain of the rat and them, it killed us the tumor alone and didn't, and didn't damage the normal cells. The mechanism of action is you know, considered to be these things here. It's anti-proliferative. That means it prevents the cells from multiplying, probably by inhibiting DNA replication. And it is anti-angiogenic. I mean, cancers generate new blood supply. They want new blood supply. Cancer needs plenty of oxygen and glucose and things, right? So it wants to always have a good blood supply. THC and CBD particularly can shut down this. All right, then there's, it is an anti-metastatic effect. That means a cancer is a a cancer has to move, it can move from where it is and set up itself elsewhere. And that is what usually causes most of the problem. Leave from your stomach and go to your brain and heart and all them things and liver. And, um, and, and then use up all of your nutrients and starve your normal cells to get. Or if it's into your brain, it, a tumor growing there in a rigid cage so you don't have no space to expand. So it increases the pressure and you want to push out your brain through the brain stem and just can kill it. All right. And um, it also uh, this word apoptotic or apoptotic, depending on how you want to explain it. And that means program cell death. A normal cell is programmed to multiply about, to multiply, divide about 26 times, and then it will shut up, right? Like suicide. A cancer cell now this this gene turn off. So given the right the right condition in a petri dish, a cancer cell will divide for eternity. Right? And that is what we don't want. So if cannabis can switch on back, program cell death, that we have quantum leap forward. 
And um, with us more research detail, let's find out them things are right dose and combination. And I feel, you know, we were running along. So THC and CBD work synergistically in killing cancer cells with no damage to normal cells. So we want them together. CBD, er, all right, CBD is the most common phytocannabinoid in hemp, right? And the second most common in marijuana. It has proved, how much time you have? Never too slow. Five minutes. People, we don't have a to touch by most of them. Five minutes we have left. So, let me go forward. We just want to touch on um, yeah, all them things we got through. Plenty of, not what I say, so it's, it's, um, it's unique. Um, and you can get it on the net. But we just got through this now. The endocannabinoid system. In 1992, <coughs> scientists made a startling discovery. Right, the compounds in marijuana create their effects by stimulating a previously unknown cellular communication network. This electrochemical, this electrochemical signal is known as the endocannabinoid system, and it regulates a vast number of critical processes in human physiology. This includes the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system, the immune system, the gastrointestinal tract, the reproductive system, and microcirculation. Remarkably, our own bodies, as I just said before, endogenously produce endocannabinoids, similar to THC and CBD in the brain, and other organs, glands, and the immune cells. Regardless of where they are located, the goal remains the same, homeostasis or the maintenance of a stable internal environment. People, I hope you understand what I mean. You don't have enough time to elaborate on it. But basically, if the homeostasis means that if you're in a hot environment, the body starts sweating things to cool you down. If you're in a cold environment, it might start to shiver, to warm you up. So whatever you want to change the, 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 the stableness, um, homeostasis try to keep things steady. Anybody understand what I'm going to say? All right? So, a lot of herbal things and people here so probably into alternative medicine like to talk about you must alkalinize the system and alkalinize the system and you kill cancer, you cannot alkalinize the system. So acid base balance and thing is one of the most rigidly controlled things in the system. Our pH is between 7.36 to 7.44. So if the body tell you drink pungent water and this and that for alkalinize the system and kill cancer is nonsense. If they if they succeed in alkalinizing your body, they will succeed in killing you. All right. Uh, next time we can talk that. We have enough time. All right, boss. All right. All right. So let's run it again. Regardless of where they are located, the goal remains the same. Homeostasis are the maintenance of a stable internal environment, despite fluctuation in the external environment. Today, researchers believe. It had been an integral part in the evolution of brains and nervous systems because it is part of the physiology of all animals, even creatures such as worms and jellyfish. Right? Everybody they look at to find they find in CD1 and CD2 receptors. Right? And even in ancient, very low-level animals. The first endocannabinoid receptor, CD1, was discovered, as I said, in 1988 in a rat brain and is among the most common G protein coupled receptors. Just take that. In neurons, neurons is brain cells. It's mostly found in the central nervous system. The second discovered receptor, CD2, was in 93, and this was in the rat spleen. It is mainly found in the periphery, as I said before, the heart, liver, pancreas, skin, reproductive tract, etc. All right, it is believed that there are more undiscovered receptors because so many effects of them seen happening with cannabis. These two receptors alone can explain it, so most likely more will be discovered. The first discovered endocannabinoid was, as we said before, anandamide in 92, and it is a fatty base agonist of both CB1 and CB2. Alright, so I have to wrap up. Alright, the name anandamide is based on the Sanskrit word, that's an Indian word, and ananda meaning inner bliss. Alright, let me just wrap it up. There's some more, but we can pass this on. Let me just read the last thing there. Alright. 
since we know now that this thing have a lot of medicinal properties in a rational world, we expect in a rational world, the discovery of the endocannabinoid system would have immediately ended all debate about whether cannabis is a medicine. But the FDA policy of classifying cannabis as an addictive, dangerous drug with no therapeutic use prevents medical school from even offering courses in cannabis medicine. The same federal mandated ignorance deters and distals scientific research about cannabis, most of which is funded and authorized by one agency, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. This same institute has refused to fund research into medicinal benefits of cannabis, claiming that its, its, its charter allows it only to fund research into the harms of the drug. All right, question and answer, if we have time. All right, thank you, Dr. Pattinger. So, a lot of information put out there, but hopefully you can elaborate when we, go, when we get the questions. Um, have a question. Hi, I don't want you to get any criticism, but I would like to know, I would like to know how you're incorporating cannabinoid therapy into your cannabinoid practice. All right. It's very difficult because Trinidad is a backward country compared even to the rest of the Caribbean with respect to freeing up this thing. So I have to be doing it illegally and, um, and um, taking a chance, which I don't really want to be taking a chance. I have some patients like, for instance, ovarian cancer patients who don't want to, after they have the debulking surgery, no care how good the surgery is, you can't take out what you can't see and you tend to have recurrence without chemo. If you debulk effectively and then give them, you know, combination chemo with something called taxal and carboplatin over six cycles, one every 21 days, you can cure plenty of ovarian cancer. Without the chemo, you're almost 100% recurrent. This lady don't want to use no chemo. So I have to be taking the chance. I explained this to her and she want to try it. So I've given her full spectrum cannabis oil, not hemp oil, which is CBD, but the full spectrum. But we have some virgin who produce the thing locally in Trinidad. And, and next thing you know, I do this and, you know, man of a draw down for me and you, so boy, I don't particular peddling drugs and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a stress. Are you going PO or are you going PB? Orally. So, we um, I ask them to put it on the tongue, hold it as long as possible. So, so you know, the longer you hold it, you could absorb straight into the capillaries and go straight in the system. Because when you swallow the oil, it will go to the liver, and the liver will metabolize it. And especially THC, one of the metabolites of THC could cause nausea and drugginess and things like that. So, um, that is the way I'm using it. Never use it PV, no. Eh? Why not go the other way? Well, I learned it from you now. You have to go tell me about it. I've never used it, never come across it, so uh, it enlightened me after. Cool? So, two hands raised. Huh? Could you qualify the expanded depression with the meal, marijuana, and the empty? I tend to get confused as well with M and marijuana. I don't know if I'm best qualified to do this. I have all the planters about the place, so they might be better. But the hemp and the marijuana is basically the same plant. It's not a different species. But I think, depending on how you grow it, under the horticultural condition, how much light and how much oxygen and whatever, whatever, um, and, and keeping the female plant a separate from the male plant is some of the main differences between it. So the hemp plant, I mean, if you're growing it for fiber and to, to make cloth and clothes and all this kind of thing and so, the people don't smoke that because the THC is so low, you can't really get any high out of it. But it, let's just put it's the same plant but under different conditions, the plant versatile, it will adapt to certain things. So you could actually you know, breed up or breed down. But hemp basically means the male plant because not have the female flowers and normally produce the, 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 the resins that have the highest level of THC, right? So the male plant, most people will say with well, a male synonymous with hemp. 
it, it making any difference? Why the female plant synonymous with what we call marijuana? Because marijuana, say, say marijuana synonymous with higher THC. That make any sense? All right. Yes, I got. Uh, have you looked at um, using suppositories for your patients? You can get a little higher dose uh, and bypass the liver. No, is this I the could hear what he was saying. He was saying to try PV for a vagina. Yes, yes. So you could do it in the yes. vaginal or anal, right? Yes. So yes. it's the same thing. Yes. So the, two, the point the tour you're making is good. And, and we have to start looking into it because the deleterious effect of the first pass to the liver would, right. would not be there. Yes. You're already you're doing it with Chicago. Well, I want the information. So I, I will it for learn. I'm a sponge. I come for learn, right? And it, the point it to you raise is beautiful point. Yes, so what they're trying to say is to avoid the oral route which we know the liver will metabolize and cause some potential side effect so if you use it vaginally or if you use it rectally or i will bypass this first pass effect but i think probably you, have, you need something like a lozenges uh, or some kind of capsule or tablet right which we don't have Right, so I don't know how to tell somebody to squirt the oil into the rectum or squirt the oil into the vagina. So we, we need to get some kind of tablet, yeah, that I could use. Any other questions for Dr. Pattinger? All right, so when we give thanks, Dr. Pattinger, great.